2022 is my 10 year anniversary for owning and modifying 3D printers. Today we're going to revisit three of my craziest mods to see if they have any merit. Twenty twelve was an exciting time for me. As a teacher, I was in charge of a MakerBot Replicator One, a three D printer I remember being quite good. But what was really exciting was getting my first three D printer at home, a Solidoodle Two. That machine had limitations, but I was part of an amazing collaborative community that was dedicating to designing upgrades. Some of these mods are pretty wacky, so we're going to revisit three to evaluate if they're still worthwhile. Let's rewind approximately 10 years and see my first home 3D printer in action. It was the top model of the Solidoodle 2 and it was about 500 US dollars, which even back then was one of the cheaper options compared to offerings from MakerBot and Ultimaker. Compared to today's standard of hobby 3D printer, it was quite archaic. No PEI sheets or build tack back then, Captain tape straight to an aluminium bed. Therefore it was ripe for modification and upgrade and that's what I did and I'd have to say I was quite addicted to it. My first mod was to add a Panalolu LCD and adapt a mounting kit for that. And these menus should look familiar because they're from a very early version of Marlin, just like the vast majority of 3D printers use now. After this I have to admit I went a little overboard with modifications. Every part of the printer was a potential upgrade and I really enjoyed the process of designing parts and releasing them to share with the Solidoodle community. So let's revisit and test some of the more unusual ones, starting with making my own heated bed PCB. These days off the shelf heated PCB beds are a dime a dozen. They have a circuit built in for a thermistor and overall they're very straightforward to use. But my Solidoodle 2 didn't come with this. It had a heater strapped into the middle of the aluminium plate, much like you can see here on this monoprice mini delta. Except on the Solidoodle, it was much smaller and the bed was bigger. Not only was the heating very uneven, but the performance was abysmal. We're talking 15 minutes to get from 45 degrees to 60 degrees Celsius. With things like this, I'm very impatient, so I needed a better solution. Another common option these days is a mains powered silicon heater pad from companies like Kinovo. And although that didn't exist back then, we did manage to find a silicon pad the right size for the Solidoodle bed. It was DC powered and it even had a thermistor inbuilt. I designed these special bed mounting clips and a four part jigsaw style system to match the contours of the silicon pad, which could then rest on top and have a piece of glass clamped over the top. Even though this was DC instead of mains powered, the performance increase was huge. But even so, I wasn't entirely satisfied. And that brings us back to the custom heated bed PCB. I actually designed this bed in Adobe Illustrator instead of any PCB design software. I knew the thickness of the copper I would be using, so then I designed the width as well as the total length of the trace to give a specific resistance to provide the maximum amperage my power supply and mainboard could handle. And just so I could get the most out of it, I changed the terminals on the mainboard and added some additional wires underneath to help with the higher amperage. Looking back on this, I can see it was pretty rough. To make PCBs back then, I would print out the circuit on some glossy paper, strap it to the PCB, jam it through a laminator to transfer the toner to the copper. This was pretty good, but still needed some Sharpie to touch up some areas before I used chemicals to etch away the unwanted copper and complete the design. These days, making a PCB like this takes only a few minutes using my CNC router. And after trimming the outside of the board, including taking too much off on one corner, we're just about ready to test. We apply some flux pen to the two terminals we'll be soldering on, add some solder to these, as well as tinning the wires we're adding on, and we can quickly solder some power cables to the bed to make it operational. With this design, there's no protective silkscreen layer, which means anything metal will short and destroy the bed, so on the original, I insulated it with Captain Tape. Before adding power, I used a multimeter to test the resistance of the circuit and measured around 0.8 of an ohm. Using Ohm's law and substituting in this resistance as well as the 12 volt power supply, this heater should draw 15 amps and therefore have a power of 180 watts. Back in the day I tested it and found the heat up was even faster than the silicon pad. But now I've got some more testing tools, so let's see how the new bed goes. Using a clamp meter, we can see that when the power is first turned on, 
we draw a little over 17 amps and this drops as the heater gains temperature. But best of all is watching the bed heat up with a thermal camera. It's not strapped to an aluminium plate and the rest of the bed assembly, so it is heating up faster than it ever did on the printer. And that means it only took a minute or so before the temperature reached 100 degrees and warmed up a nice little hot spot on my table. The center part of the circuit was designed to be less dense because on the printer, heat tends to soak there, so my aim was to improve distribution. I successfully recreated the mod, so what's my verdict on it? I would say it's still surprisingly effective, so it might be a viable solution if you've got a heater that has an unusual shape. For anything else however, it's just easier and safer to buy an off the shelf product. Apart from the bed being do it yourself, it was a pretty conventional component. So how about something a little bit more out of left field? 3D printers typically use belts as a means to create linear motion from the rotational output of stepper motors. Modern belts are high quality and reinforced so they don't stretch. The Solidoodle however, as delivered, had pretty cheap and nasty belts. So that's why I replaced them with something quite experimental. On our community forum called Soliforum, member 2N2R5 posted up a mod for a beltless drive for the X and Y axes. As you can see, the belts have been replaced with what looks like string, but it is in fact fishing line. I'm not a fisherman, but I did find out from this mod that you can find very high tensile strength fishing line. As you can see, it's advertised as having zero stretch, unlike the belts that came on the printer. And it can be very strong, for instance this line supporting 80 pounds or 36 kilograms. And it's actually surprisingly easy to fit, so I'm going to test it on the Y axis of this TiVo Tornado bed slinger. We take the tension off the existing belt, snip the cable ties holding the ends together, and pull off the old belt. We then measure out a generous length of fishing line, I went for about one and a half times longer than I thought I needed, and we feed it through the center extrusion, just like you would if you were installing a rubber belt. We guide it over the idler pulley at the front of the machine, hook it onto the belt mount for the carriage, and create some tight knots to hold it in place. Having the additional length fishing line helps with grip here. For the stepper motor end, we can use the existing pulley, and we simply take the line and wrap it at least three times around the pulley, before then taking it to the other side of the Y carriage. We then tie another knot, add some cable ties to stop the line from slipping off, and tension the fishing line just like we would using the existing Y-axis tensioning mechanism. And that's it, fishing line installed and ready for a test print. I imagine some people are screaming at the screen saying that this just won't work, so here's some footage of the machine homing with the fishing line in place, and of course some footage of the printer completing a test print. So clearly this does in fact work, but how does it affect print quality? The first thing to realize is that these blobs on the outside of the model are not because of the fishing line. Instead, they come from this switching hot end system, needing some fresh tape to seal the nozzle that's not currently printing. Apart from that, you could describe this as a passable 3D print. But when we compare it to the same G-code printed with a belt, we can see that the belted version is superior. The fishing line is harder to get a suitable tension, and therefore we have some ripples in the surfaces, and also much sharper corners on the belted version. On this printer, the quality is a step backwards. Therefore, the verdict on this mod is quite clear. If you had a broken printer and you had no belts on hand, you could use fishing line to get you out of a pinch, but in all other cases, modern belts are simply superior to fishing line. I've saved my favorite until last. It looks like it should never work, but miraculously, it does. The Z axis on most 3D printers these days use threaded lead screws and nuts. There can be some backlash, but overall they're pretty solid. It might be hard to see it up the back there, but the Solidoodle 2 did not come with one of these. Instead, to cut costs, it used regular threaded rod with a nut. And not only did this have a lot of backlash, it was an imperial size, which means the steps per millimeter were all over the place. My first upgrade was to change to M5 threaded rod, which had a finer pitch, which meant more precision and less backlash. And this proved to be effective, with the Z banding I had suffered almost completely gone. But of course, I wanted more. And again, it was 2N2R5 to the rescue with a threadless ball screw design. 
This design uses a completely smooth hardened steel rod, 8mm in diameter, which you would normally couple with linear bearings, as seen in 3D printers such as the Prusa Mark III. The other key components are standard metal ball bearings. This design originally came from Mark Solak, but it was 2N2R5 that converted the design to run on OpenSCAD. You can still download the file from Thingiverse and change as many of the parameters as you like to suit the particular bearings you have in stock, the diameter of the smooth rod, and many other parameters. Keen to try this again, I downloaded and printed the SDL. Assembly is remarkably easy. We use a screw to engage the thread and pull the trapped nuts into position, and after this, we use the same screw to bolt the bearings into place, making sure they're not so tight that the bearings are unable to spin freely. Repeat three times and we are done. Now comes the magic part. We take our smooth rod and we rotate the printed piece into position until the bearings start to engage and lo and behold, it acts exactly like a threaded rod and nut. It really feels quite strange and is immensely satisfying to play with. A remarkable out of the box design that seems to defy logic. Best of all, compared to a traditional lead screw and nut, it's actually got very little play. In fact, I'd say like a ball screw, it has zero backlash. Unfortunately, on the TiVo Tornado, there's just not enough room to fit this threadless ball screw. Therefore, you'll have to take my word for the performance. After I fixed some alignment issues, I ran this mod for quite some time on my Solidoodle. In fact, I only stopped when the wear from the bearings left permanent indentations in the smooth rod. And at that point, I switched to an actual ball screw as you can see in the background of these printing shots. So the verdict on the threadless ball screw, it was actually surprisingly capable and accurate and remained so until it wore out. If you've got some smooth rod and bearings, I'd say follow the link in the description and print one to try yourself. On that printer, I had many, many more mods than this and I do have a summary video available if you're interested. Some of these mods were considered cutting edge at the time but these days, even cheap 3D printers have better performing components. Even so, it was nice to take a trip down memory lane and to try some of them out again. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy experimental 3D printer modding. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.